I finally decided to make this video that I was hoping I wouldn't have to. I have a very serious life-threatening condition. I arrived, by the way, here in the UK for the second time to live here in 2008, March 2008, um, partly because my wife was not going to be given long-term status to stay in the United States with me. and. Um, she's a Hungarian national and I happen to be a dual national but born in America um, and I can't live in Hungary for various reasons I don't want to have to explain in this video but rest assured I can't go there um, it's not safe for me uh, it has something to do with my ethnicity and my uh, ethno-religious and cultural ethnicity but uh, that aside my uh, wife and I um, decided that, you know, we couldn't stay in the United States anymore, so we sold the car that we had just bought. Um, and with that money, I first came to London in March 2008. And approximately four months later, I lost my ability to sense thirst. Just one day out after another, one day, the next day, I was just no longer sensing thirst and I didn't quite realize what had happened to me until a couple of days later I was suddenly aware that if I ate something salty I wasn't feeling thirst this had, all my life I've sensed thirst until that point and it really scared me and I had been having some serious um, health problems already uh, prior to losing my sense of thirst in um, the summer of uh, 2008 I had a period of about four years or so where I had uh, what is what appears to have been diabetes insipidus because I had constant thirst I mean lots of thirst and I was drinking a lot and urinating a lot so I had what was otherwise would have been diagnosed as diabetes insipidus, but you have to know that in the United States I didn't have any health insurance coverage, I didn't have anywhere to go, no doctors to see me about that. And I even wasn't not really aware of the severity of that issue, of that condition, although it did bother me. I figured because we were living first in California in the hot weather that maybe just I'm getting older and I need to drink more. But no, I was really constantly thirsty, drinking constantly fluids, and urinating constantly. And then I started developing Reinout syndrome, which means I would wake up in the morning sometimes, my fingers would be turning kind of dark black brown because of lack of blood flow and oxygen. Um, same thing at, 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 um, in my feet, not so severely and um, I started developing edema and sometimes if I slept on one eye or the other and the circulation got cut off I would wake up with temporary blindness so basically I had uh, circulatory problems I was gaining weight um, and I had this constant thirst and constant urination so as I say four months after arriving in the UK in 2008 um, and the reason I came here was because um, I came in advance of my wife who was still able to work in the United States she still had her temporary status they weren't planning on uh, extending for the long term because of our socioeconomic condition we just had you know we suffered like so many people in the world uh, during 2007 2008 we lost a lot of ground a lot of what we little we had we were poor but what little we had, we had to sell the car and everything. Anyway, I decided I'm going back to Europe, and Kathy would have to anyway. But we couldn't go back to Hungary because, as I was explaining, because of my own personal um, life and uh, ethno-religious, cultural background, it's not safe for me to live in the country um, that I am holding a EU passport. So as an EU citizen, I'm allowed to live here in the UK with my spouse, who is an EU citizen of Hungary, and I'm, uh, I'm therefore entitled to services here, um, basic services like national health uh, service, which um, 
I would have thought would have really helped me in, and it's been an, it's been mostly not good what I've experienced. What happened was that after I lost my sense of thirst, I had to wait another two months for Kathy to join me in London. Uh, also, I had been experiencing some really terrible experiences in a group housing situation where I was, harassment, threats, anti-Semitic attacks, you name it, just terrible things, criminals trying to uh, extort money from me, a landlord who acted like whatever, but really nasty people. And the stress was really extreme as well, so it didn't help me at all. But I was already in ill health, and so I, when I lost my sense of thirst, like I said, I didn't, um, for a couple of days, I didn't really realize it. But I, ever since then, to this day, I don't have any sense of thirst. Nothing. I mean, you could put some very salty food in front of me, and if I ate it, which I have to be very careful that I don't actually eat very salty food, but if I did, it wouldn't trigger any um, thirst sensation. It would just make me very unwell, and I would have to quickly drink a lot of fluids. And I dehydrate very quickly. That, that had already been happening during the time that I had diabetes insipidus, which I probably still have, but because I don't sense thirst, I'm not drinking constantly and I'm not urinating constantly. I'm simply dehydrating constantly, very severely, especially at night when I sleep. There are several times at night I wake up with episodes of hypoxia, which means there's just not enough oxygen to my brain. I've even bought a, a, a pulse oximeter to, to detect the amount of oxygen uh, and my pulse rate in my bloodstream. And it's, it's, not, it's not healthy. It's really not good. We're not talking uh, 98 over 100, and we're certainly not talking a pulse rate that's healthy either. My pulse rate tends to be above normal. Um, sometimes, even at rest, sometimes it's 115, 120. My um, oxygen levels, when I'm having these incidents of hypoxia during my sleep, when I wake up suddenly dehydrated, my, my mouth's sticky, um, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm feeling very unwell, and I have to drink water right away. And sometimes I overheat in my head. That's another thing. Not only do I not sense thirst at all since 2000, summer of 2008, I also have thermal regulatory problems. That means that when I go outside, if I'm not dressed warmly enough, my body temperature, even in relatively you know, temperate weather when it's not too cold, even then my body temperature suddenly just starts dropping. And if I go into a supermarket to shop and I'm not dressed very warmly in the summer and I go by the cold aisles, my body temperature just drops. And uh, at night when I'm sleeping, my head to the pillow and I'm asleep and I'm dehydrating as I am during the day as well. But at night, my head just gets overheated. I, I don't sweat. I, I don't shiver when I get cold. I don't sweat when I get hot. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit of, uh, yeah, sweatiness, but it's not like, you know, it's not, a, it's not a profuse sweating. It's not a lot, and I certainly don't ventilate properly when I, when I get hot. So I made, uh, finally, uh, after my wife ar arrived, I decided that eventually I would go and find a, a GP, a general practitioner. Initially, I had intended to do so in North London where we were living at the time, but we were going through some really horrible experiences with I don't want to even begin to tell you some really horrible experiences with criminals, horrible people doing terrible things to us in these group housing situations where we were renting rooms. It's twice we had to call the police, but the police were only there to help us uh, move out. They were basically to uh, watch us as we were moving out and, and nothing else. So uh, we barely escaped from the situation we were suffering from in North London. But during that time, I, I couldn't really feel that I could trust the neighborhood to find a general practitioner. And I, something you have to know if you're an American watching this, an American doctor, if you're not a British doctor, the NHS doesn't allow you to just go anywhere in London where you, you know, to, to seek a general practitioner or physician, doctor. You have to go within a certain limited radius of where you live. And well, for whatever reasons. And there's apparently no exceptions, though I've requested that. So I, I didn't get a doctor in North London. But when we finally did move out of North London and we moved f closer to where Wembley Stadium is, I finally did um, uh, go to a clinic and uh, basically register. And I had my first general practitioner here. And I told him, I gave him a written list of all my complaints. The fact that I don't sense thirst at all. 
Not a slight sense of thirst, nothing, no sense of thirst. That I'm having these thermoregulatory problems, that I'm having Reinhardt syndrome, that I'm having edema, swelling in my limbs and my legs, that um, I, I have other uh, symptoms of being unwell, especially when I dehydrate constantly. And, if, and I was really, because at first I was not aware of how much I was dehydrating and how severely, I, I certainly wasn't even making an effort to drink anywhere as much as I had to and I was uh, going through pretty uh, horrible shock experiences. Um, it supposedly is due to buildup of lactic acidosis because you're, when you're dehydrated um, and your your bloodstream is, is, is thick or whatever, it's not um, thin enough and it's not <laughs> watery enough, when your blood plasma situation is out of balance and it's too sticky, then of course your oxygen uh, ability to, to move oxygen around your body is limited. And there's a lot of problems that can happen with that. It's very, very dangerous, uh, or acidosis in general in your bloodstream, which is very life-threatening. So I went to this doctor. I told him my complaints. I said, listen, I, I don't sense thirst. I have, these, uh, I have edema and swelling in my legs and my limbs. I have Reinhardt syndrome waking up with poor circulation in my fingers, um, I have this overheating in my head when I sleep, uh, and, and, and if it's too cold, my body temperature drops too fast, that's just basic failure of my thermoregulatory system. And I told him also that I had um, some problems with um, my diet in terms of weight, and I was just constantly gaining weight, I still am. And um, so he started some investigations, including, I had some heart problems too, by the way. It later turned out that, that I was already losing my electrolyte balance and uh, other uh, vital minerals and uh, vitamins balance was just being lost. And I was gradually losing my muscle tone, my, 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 all my muscles were weakening, severely weakening because of lack of magnesium and potassium and other vitals. And I didn't know about that at the time, but I was getting weaker. And as a result of that, I was having um, some serious heart um, irregularity and um, trouble, you know, basically um, having any energy. Oh, that's another thing. Because of this diabetes insipidus, but also more so because of this now condition where I may still have diabetes insipidus, but without any sense of thirst. Because of my total inability to sense thirst, my energy levels, because of the imbalances in my osmolality and my homeostasis is out of whack, because of that, I have like bouts of, I mean, periods of energy that suddenly I hit a wall and, I, and all the energy just drops. Now that was also investigated in the last few years when I've been seeing these two different doctors. And just recently, I was finally diagnosed as having a high insulin resistance condition or pre-diabetic high insulin resistance. Um, it would be diabetes mellitus too if it developed further. And uh, for that, I was prescribed something, but I can't take that because it's contraindicated in the person who has no sense of thirst. I had to find that out myself. But I I'm going to get to that later, but go a little bit back again. So the first doctor I saw, I told him all these symptoms. And I mean, typed them on a piece of on um, sheets of paper and submitted to him. And he started some investigations. And then a my wife was with me, by the way, almost all the time whenever I went to see him, when she, especially at the beginning, the first time, and at the last time, she definitely was there. Well, the very last time I saw him was, we didn't know it was going to be the last time. We tell the doctor um, that, you know, this is really bad that so far we haven't found out what's most important is why I don't sense thirst at all and what could it mean. I, I already had some theories based on what is generally known about um, thirst mechanisms. So I had my own theories, which... I'm beginning to see are absolutely logical and correct. Uh, I've had to basically, you know, do research, tons of research on the internet, serious medical journals, uh, JAMA, um, Lancet, uh, New England Journal of Medical Science, you name it. So I've been, I've been doing tons of research of peer-reviewed articles, uh, things by doctors for doctors, explaining different symptoms of different diseases, different therapies, different cures, you name it to find out, to hope to find out what's wrong with me in the meantime, while I'm waiting for the actual doctors to do something for me, um, to, to get the right you know, diagnosis for me. So the first doctor, at the end of the 
whole year that I'd been seeing it, roughly a year, he says to me, um, oh, what is this? I was showing him my legs swelling. I said, don't forget, I have edema. He said, that's odd. I'd never seen that before. That's what he said. I'd never seen it before. My wife was shocked. Something's wrong with the guy because he actually had seen it. His mind was not right. Now, I know that these doctors here are overwhelmed with lots of patients and they act like they really care about each one of those patients, but as I can tell, they can't. If they, even if they wanted to, they just can't give them the, the right, right kind of attention, the right seriousness of attention. So I was shocked, my wife was shocked, that he had like said that he didn't know about that. But in fact, I, that was one of my main complaints, is edema, swelling uh, in my legs and my limbs. And then he says to me, by the way, uh, just to let you know, I won't be practicing at this clinic anymore. And I said, oh, that's terrible. Where, where can I find you if I need you? And he says, well, actually, I won't be practicing medicine at all. I'm leaving the profession. And I asked him why, and he wouldn't elaborate. He skirted the issue, but as we later found out, he had been sued for malpractice. I, I don't want to get involved in legal issues because we ourselves have thought about, you know, <laughs> not suing for malpractice, but making a major complaint with what's called the Primary Care Trust, which is an, an organization within each area that deals where you're going to your um, doctor, each area has a general practice, um, whatever, uh, primary care trust organization that you can complain to in theory, and they're supposed to help you. And there may, there may yet be a primary care trust complaint, because here's what happened. After that terrible shock that this doctor was not taking me seriously enough, and nothing had yet been done to investigate my lack of thirst, I mean, nothing serious. Um, there was attempts to measure my diabetes insipidus, but it was not conclusive. Um, and there was some other test for my heart condition, which initially, by the way, he comes out with a report that they did find um, diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. And oddly enough, that was initially found, and now, more recently, another test was done on my heart, another series of tests, and they didn't find anything of that sort. But that's since, since I've been taking magnesium supplementation. So magnesium can, and potassium, these things together, and, and when you need it, can save your life. Yeah. So anyway, going back. So I was very shocked, right? And my wife was thinking about we should take action. And I lost my confidence in, in, in doctors here. Uh, because I'd had some other unpleasant experience with some of the specialists that I had been sent to by my doctor. One of them made some false statements about what I had said in a letter to my doctor. So there was some very unpleasant experiences. I lost my faith in the NHS system here in, in the UK. And then uh, what happened later for about a period of three, four months, I had no doctor, right? Between doctors. And then in early March or oh, sorry, around sometime in March of 2011, I had already been for several months, even before this doctor quit on me, the first one, I had been experiencing more and more weakness in my in my muscles in my in my everywhere my, i could hardly do the big one because i couldn't push hard enough to it was very difficult for me to defecate um i had trouble going upstairs and i had pain in my joints and my knees and then finally two horrible incidents that really knocked me out um i could have died i was t two nights in a row i was like waking up with such weakness of my heart that, and I was slumping out of bed with no muscle strength. I literally was like a sack of rice. I had no energy and my heart was fluttering in my chest. It was so weak and I was having trouble breathing and everything. And I was saying, that's it. I'm going to, I'm definitely going to die if this is, this is what's happening. So I started redoubling my efforts to investigate what could be my problem by going on the internet and looking at all the literature and I started putting in there you know muscle failure weakness and everything and lo and behold I was lucky I, I did it on YouTube I hadn't usually I hadn't done it on YouTube I just done it in a regular Google search regular Yahoo search I hadn't thought of doing it on YouTube and I guess what I found out that people who have um, muscle failure as a result of chronic illness are probably deficient in magnesium and also potassium and some other things con correlated. So I, I, I right away we bought some magnesium supplements at the supermarket and, and it didn't like restore me to health of course. It didn't bring back my sense of thirst. I still don't sense thirst. But it, it, it did save me because it did restore most of my muscle strength. Well, not entirely, but it, it's really helped me. It's, it's, really, it's keeping me alive, taking um, not all the time, but as often as I feel I should. 
sort of intuitive at this point how much magnesium and potassium I take almost every day, but almost sometimes every other day. And sometimes I go without a few days. But anyway, so, but still I was scared and I decided, okay, I'm going to go and try to find another general practitioner, another GP. So I, I did locate another clinic. I, I registered. I got another GP. This guy seemed more mature, older, more experienced, somebody I thought I could trust. Do I think I can trust him? He's still technically, as, as, as far as I know, he's still technically my GP. It's not maybe whether I can trust him or not. For some reason, he too is not taking me seriously enough. I don't know whether it's intentional or not, but I think he doesn't realize or doesn't want to or doesn't care to. I don't know. I don't know whether it's intentional or not. I really don't know. I'm not alleging that. But I told him the same symptoms, that I don't sense thirst. Not a little bit of thirst. I don't sense any thirst at all. Okay, I repeat that because it's it's important to understand that that is a condition that if you tell that, and as I found out by calling some doctors in the United States, most would refuse to talk to me on the phone about anything. But one or two did at the Albert Einstein School of Medicine in New York. It's somebody who deals with hypothalamic pituitary axis damage, brain. It's right, if you take between my eyes and between my ears and you draw lines, it's somewhere there in the middle of my crania. There's a little thing called the pituitary gland and then there's the hypothalamus and there's the posterior pituitary and the, the hypothalamus connects to the pituitary through the posterior pituitary and if there's damage to this, lesions or if there's a tumor next to it, these can be causes for a person to lose their sense of thirst. And actually as people get older and, and, and um, you know, as, as you get older you just your body wears down, you're exposed to environmental factors, uh, chemicals in your foods, um, you're exposed to radiation in the background, uh, and all these things, stress over time, all these things cause damage to your organs. And the most sensitive, one of the most sensitive organs is the pituitary hypothalamus, uh, uh, these organs. These, these things can get damaged very easily if you're not cautious. Uh, major head trauma, if you have an accident in a car and you have major head trauma, that can cause you to have serious damage to your pituitary um, uh, uh, hypothalamus axis. And then you can lose sense again. But, but actually, to have diabetes insipidus in combination with adipsia, this is what it's called. Uh, failure to sense thirst is called adipsia. A-D-I-P-S-I-A. And if you have adipsia in combination with diabetes insipidus, by the way, diabetes insipidus is not regular sugar diabetes. Though it turns out now that they finally did find that I have highly insulin resistant condition, which if I were healthy and I didn't have, I'm sorry, if I was otherwise healthy and I didn't have this adipsia, then it would be okay to take this certain medication that I was just prescribed by the specialist. So anyway, the doctor I'm seeing now, he's just not taking me seriously enough. And I'm really frightened for my life. I'm really disappointed with the NHS. I don't think it... I think it... Um, let me clarify something. Apparently, it does very good for, you know, if you have um, pediatric care for children, it's excellent. If you have geriatric care for elderly people in old age homes, it's pretty good. If you have a sudden heart attack or something and you need ambulatory services, emergency services, then the NHS is fantastic. But if you have a chronic underlying complex set of health problems, like I do, uh, and hard to uh, easily diagnose, but it, it can be diagnosed, by the way. I found out that adipsia can be, in a sense, easily diagnosed, but it still requires that your doctor uh, knows what, what needs to be done. And this is what's shocking me. This GP, if he had done as much research as I've done, which didn't really take me too much time, he would have found out that this is what it is and this is what needs to be done to determine this for sure just because you know they can't technically proceed in terms of providing me any therapeutic you know help um any cures there's no cure for this by the way apparently there's no cure for adipsia um but they can provide therapeutic help and they also can register you as being semi-disabled or disabled whatever and that's I, I really couldn't function in a normal work environment anymore since I've lost my sense of thirst. It's just I can't. Um, I have to pay so much attention to my own needs and ensuring that I drink enough. Even as I'm talking right now, I'm dehydrating and it gets a certain acrid, acidic taste in my mouth. It's really bad. But the thing is that... Um, so the current GP, I told him the same problems and he sent me for investigations of all kinds because at that time I, I had already had the results of this muscular failure and uh, though I was slightly improving, I was still very weak and I had developed sleep apnea. 
Um, so my tongue's muscles were weak and my tongue was falling back and I was having sleep apnea. That was diagnosed and I received, by benefit of the NHS, I received the CPAP machine, a machine that helps regulate your breathing and forces air into your lungs. And that helped a lot. And I still occasionally, when I'm not feeling well, I sometimes use it. But for the most part, um, it was very useful for an extended period of time. It's not an easy thing to wear because you have to wear this mask. Anyway, that's beside the point. So now we're at the point where, um, like I said, only uh, um, less than a month ago, I was finally diagnosed with uh, what they found from my blood um, tests that I have insulin insulin resistance and a certain medication okay I'm gonna say what it is metformin was prescribed and uh, when the doctor prescribed this my wife was with me again as a witness um, I asked him in no uncertain terms is metformin okay for somebody who has no sense of thirst is, is there any chance that it could be contraindicated are there any contraindications for uh, people with damaged thirst mechanism to take metformin he said no. I said, are you sure? He said, no. I mean, that that he's sure that there isn't. Well, lo and behold, I after my unpleasant experiences with all these medical doctors and specialists, and it's not the first time I've had unpleasant experiences with doctors. In my life, I would say roughly one-third of the doctors I have ever seen were really good. Another third were so-so, and another third were absolute failures. Well, I checked on this medication because before I even... I got the prescription, but I even before I would have even gotten the medication, which I never got, I still have this prescription that I haven't cashed in. Um, if I hadn't checked and I had taken that medication, I might not be alive. You might not be hearing this video because metformin, apparently even its own, uh, pres what's, what's in the, um, you know, the description of the medication that's given with the medication, uh, the contraindications so very clearly state that if you have a damaged thirst mechanism, you're not to take it. And so to double check, just to be double certain, I did something that most people wouldn't do. I called the company in the United States that produces this um, medication, metformin. I called them and I asked, without saying anything that I'm a doctor, I never said that. I just said the patient. I said the patient has this problem. Well, they didn't ask me if I was a doctor. They assumed because of the way I spoke about the patient. I spoke about my third self in a third person terms. I said the patient has these symptoms. Should they take metformin? They said, well, we really don't know. We just handle this side of the company's issues, but we're going to connect you to the specialist. So they actually gave me his mobile <laughs> number. And I speak to the man who's most involved in deciding such issues about the efficacy, uh, uh, the current, you know, constant feedback they're getting on the medication metformin and whether or not it's okay for me to take it or sorry whether it's not okay for anybody to take it who has a uh, totally damaged thirst mechanism and and guess what he said he i said if the person has a dipsia with or without di without um, diabetes insipidus um, does this medication is this medication indicated or contraindicated and he said it's contraindicated. I said you're sure. He said absolutely don't take it. Do not take it. Don't or do not give it to the patient if he has no sense of thirst. It's absolutely don't. So that's it's it's confirming what they already admit. It's not be taken by somebody who doesn't um, sense thirst properly. And the reason for that is because the medication metformin, um, what it does is it helps your your um, your ability to use your insulin to deliver the sugars to your cells so that it becomes energy. But in a healthy, relatively healthy person, um, the amount of lactic acidosis that it creates is minimal and the kidneys can take care of that. But in a person like me who has a totally damaged thirst mechanism, the amount of lactic acidosis buildup that I would result from even taking once this medication has a 50-50 chance, uh, sorry, 50% mortality rate. So I think to myself, well, what, what's, what the hell is going on here? What is going on? My, my life is at stake here. I'm 48 years of age. I have no history in my life of abusing my own health. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I've never taken drugs. I mean, I drink a little bit of alcohol, but not, I'm not, in other words, I've never been an alcoholic. I've never drunk, drunk excessively. I don't have a problem with, with my liver. Uh, I have some evidence that there's some lesions on my kidneys. They, they, they saw that when they did the check also on my heart. Uh, with some uh, sonogram and uh, um, basically 
suggestion that I may have had an infection at one point, or or I found out some poisoning, some heavy metal poisoning can do it too. So something caused damage to my kidneys, okay? And there's some lesions on there. So I'm I'm certainly not supposed to take this medication. Problem is that for the person who is insulin um, resistant, this medication can be helpful because it allows you to get back your your ability to use the sugar properly and balance out, especially if you have a low GI diet, you know, uh, glu um, glycemic index diet. You have to re you have to cut out certain foods difficult to metabolize uh, foods such as um, complex carbohydrates. So it's a low GI diet is what I would have been doing in combination with taking metformin. So I was very distraught when I found this out. Uh, this was about about a couple weeks ago. And I tried to um, decide whether I'm not going to go back to my GP. I'm afraid of him. I'm sorry. I'm afraid of my own doctor. Because I keep telling him all this time that I would like to have... And inside the hospital investigation, I need to be observed for one or two weeks in a, in a, 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 a controlled hospital environment to determine what are all my symptoms. He says that thing doesn't exist in the UK. Well, I found out that's not entirely so. There are areas in the UK where they can do that for you. But because of the large cities and money problems with the NHS and all that, technically they don't for most people. Uh, or actually, if you end up almost dead in the uh, emergency room, then it can happen that you end up being observed for X number of days or even weeks or sometimes longer. So if I were under a controlled in-house, in-hospital observation for you know, a period of time where everything is being monitored, right? All my vital signs uh, to determine how much oxygen is actually being um being used by my brain, you know, if there's enough, if there's sufficient oxygenation, oxygen in my bloodstream. Well, I know there isn't because I just, I just know that. I've been measuring it already. If it's not good in my, if the measurement through my finger of my oxygen level is not good, then it, it explains how much worse it could be when I'm overheating in my head. I've, I've been doing everything I can to try to help myself. But, but in the end, this will kill me unless I get the proper, um, things that I need. For example, I need to be diagnosed officially so that I can then be given maybe vasopressin or something, some intervention that will help maybe not restore my sense of thirst, but restore my uh, ability to, you know, um, deal with my dehydration better and, and, and whatever. And to get some document that says that I'm not able to function properly in a normal, in a normally or average workplace. And now I'm, I'm facing the thing that the doctor's on vacation. He's coming back this coming week. And I'm scared. I'm afraid to go and, and actually see him. Because I had to even speak to somebody who knows him, who I know from somebody who I know, to get his phone number because they wouldn't con connect me to him. When I have any time I ever had any life-threatening complaints, I've had so much trouble getting in touch with my own doctor. Because the clinic, the people working there, refused to connect me to him. So I finally got his number and I called him. And he it turns out he was on vacation somewhere abroad, outside of the United Kingdom. And I told him that, no, no, I can't take this anymore. For, I've, I've done my own research. Everything indicates that I definitely have a dipsia in combination possibly, most likely, with diabetes insipidus. And it's definitely, even if it's only a dipsia by itself, it's definitely not allowed for me to take metformin. And so this is very wrong that this happened in the first place. And why this is not being investigated after all this time. Now, there are investigations that can be done. For a dipsia, for example, they can do fMRI, which is magnetic res resonance imaging. Um, and and it's, a mo it's, a, it's, a, it's one while they're feeding you some saline to see if you respond to that. And also to see if there's any damage uh, lesions to, they can do another type, a simple MRI to see if you have um, damaged lesions on the surface of this little thing called the hypothalamus or the pituitary or both, or if you have a tumor. Um, most tumors you would sense actually because you'd have headaches and stuff, but you can still have a tumor and not have other than that some other problems. So anyway, that can be, that can be checked. As for the thermoregulatory problems, which are life-threatening too, in combination, because the same hypothalamus pituitary, hypothalamus regulates also your thermal regulation. So all they have to do is put me in a room without, you know, any warm clothes and put the temperature down and see how my body temperature reacts, responds. 
and they will notice that it's not healthy. It drops too much. And they will see that when I'm overheating, my, my, my head overheats, they will see that my oxygen levels in my brain go down. Once they see all that, there's no other conclusion but there is damage to the hypothalamus pituitary or one of these things, especially the hypothalamus or posterior uh, pituitary. And then they can say, well, okay, the patient was right. He has a tipsia. So that's it. I made this video because I'm scared. And if there are any doctors out there who get to see this video, please contact me through this YouTube channel. I intend to show this video to some people I know in Hungary, in the community that I belong to originally there. Uh, the, I also intend to show it to my father who is in Maryland, my, my mother and my brother there too, and other people in my life. I intend to let them know that I'm not going to let myself die because of some kind of negligence or incompetence or failure to take me seriously. And my wife is a witness to all of this. And there's plenty, we have documented so many things. We have paper documentation. And, and I'm talking about everything from what medical appointments I had in the past. So it's all there. And uh, I've had some very other, other unpleasant experiences in relation to these, these medical doctors. But my only concern is to finally get a diagnosis. One other thing that I have to mention, because of this underlying health problem, chronic health, life-threatening health problem, I've developed other symptoms like I've had, I have eczema. I never had eczema before and, or psoriasis. And then I have developed, um, which, which just I recently accidentally scraped off, but it's still there's some signs of it. I have what I saw when I looked up close before I cut it off by accident. I found that I have a, I have a melanoma or I, ha or I had it and some of the remains of it are still there that can be detected. There has to be a biopsy done. Now, <laughs> I didn't know it when I had it at first. I've had it for a couple of years now, three years or so. It got bigger and bigger, but not very fast. I didn't know how life-threatening that could be. I didn't really know that was what it was. But when I started researching that, what is that that's growing on there, and I saw that it's irregularly shaped and it's from brown to black, but like really dark brown to black with some little tiny parts which are very dry and gray and sort of bumpy, and, and, and the shape of it is not perfectly round. It's irregularly shaped, and it's little uh, black things around it spreading. Um, sound, it's such a nice name, right? Melanoma. It sounds, it sounds like a lady's name or something. But it's life-threatening. It's skin cancer. And I want you to all, all know, by the way, if any benefit for you who are not doctors watching this video, watch out for any gross on your skin because if it is skin cancer and it gets to be too deep, it'll spread into your lymph nodes. Oh yeah, that reminds me. I do have swollen lymph, lymph nodes. I even have a discoloration under my armpits that is suggestive of serious health problems including possibly cancer so it may be that the melanoma already did spread even though it's not very deep it also may be that it hasn't yet but that has to be biopsied that area of skin where this is going on there's still some areas which are darker and which are in relation to that and they can check that and they can, even if I, most of the surface was removed they can still do a biopsy and check for the underlying cutaneous layer of your skin and they can see if you have any melanoma cells okay and then that's what they need to do too that's another thing that needs to be investigated so and that's one of the reasons why I tried to contact my doctor because that that just became urgent for me the real me, re, the minute I really realized what that was a couple weeks ago that this is melanoma um, so I'm really scared and if you're a doctor out there and you're hearing any of this watching of this please let me know what you think thank you